Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Young Core Corner Podcast. I'm Nick. With me, as always, my co-host, Bianca. Bianca, what did you bring to the table today for us to drink? Spirited by our discussion with Three of Strong at the end of this episode, I made a classic hot toddy using the Merry Meeting and run amok maple syrup. I used the run amok cinnamon vanilla maple syrup, as well as a cinnamon stick and a little bit of lemon juice. Sounds tasty. Is that it's very, the it's classic, very good. Is that the classic hot toddy recipe? I don't know. I Googled classic hot toddy and that came up. Although it's not, I think, it, I think a classic hot toddy. They say, for this classic My cocktail, Google Home wants in on this cocktail conversation. Whiskey, honey, and lemon. She's telling See, us what a classic whiskey, cocktail honey, and lemon. <laughs> you're, you're not <laughs> doing a classic. Thanks, Google. Yeah, thanks, Google, for proving this point. Are lovely slow sippers or nightcaps. To find out <laughs> Let's more, hear what she has to say. Link in your Google Home or Google Assistant app. They are lovely you, night warm sippers or nightcaps. That's what she said. What? The, so yes a classic is with whiskey yours is a not so classic hot toddy i guess so i googled rum hot toddy because I, I believe when they were talking about it they had their own we don't have like an actual recipe so i was like i gotta go off something because i had no idea yeah but so it is very warm and comforting and it's not boozy it's but not you like had easy. tea you had rum you had maple syrup no i didn't have tea you have tea in your hot toddy it's not a hot toddy how's it it's, I Googled it. It's a hot toddy. What made it hot? It's hot water. That's not traditional. Okay. A hot but toddy is tea, whiskey, lemon, honey, as far as I know. Are you looking it up now? I'm looking it up now because now you're throwing me all off. It is a maple rum hot toddy. Now look up a classic hot toddy. Classic hot toddy it is very similar looking. There's still no tea in it. No? Hot water, whiskey, honey. So it's honey instead of maple syrup, lemon, and cinnamon stick. It's almost the exact same, except you use honey instead of maple syrup and whiskey instead of- You know, the two milk. primary ingredients are different. Almost the exact same. You know what? Th thank you. We learned something almost. new today. I always thought that was a tea drink. But I guess hot water and tea are basically the same thing with a little bit of wheeze in it. I'm sure there are tea versions out there. Yeah. Anyway, I took inspiration from something else and I didn't do uh, rum for this one, actually. I made a martini. Nice. Fancy. Is it the Bond martini that it you've been? It is inspired by that this weekend <laughs> i went out and saw the new james bond movie on saturday and i hadn't made one of these the weekend before when i started watching over all of the other james bond movies so i decided to make one of these again thought it would be a fun one to bring this is the vesper martini from casino royale and the it's very simple the ingredients are three ounces of gin one ounce of vodka half an ounce of Lillet Blanc aperitif, which I didn't have. So I just used regular martini and Rossi dry vermouth because uh, that's all I had. And I garnished with the lemon twist as they do, which I expressed over the glass and then rubbed around the rim. I chilled the glass in the freezer, shook it with ice. Just very advanced. It was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I went all out with it. And do you feel more like tasty. James Bond now? No, no. You're not, so not as cool as James Bond. This is my. No. Yep. Nice pink straw to match. Always. I'll tell you though, with the, this cocktail, the lemon, the lemon peel that you put in it really, really express itself. You can really taste it and smell it. It's awesome. Especially it's when you're making it and you're twisting it up and it's like, all you can smell is that fresh lemon. Citrus Wonderful. is the best in cocktails. Yeah. makes you feel high society high class when you're drinking one of these i will tell you that i believe it i feel like I, anytime i never order martinis but anytime i see someone drinking a martini they just look a different level of like sophisticated so when um, it comes as long to as it's not like like blue like some weird color 
It's like a classic martini. What if it was a classic martini, but made with that purple Empress gin? Would you think lesser of that one? No, but it wouldn't look as sophisticated. This is actually funny enough. I didn't have regular vodka. So if you look at this, it doesn't really come up through the camera too well, but see how it has a slight pinkish hue. Mm -hmm. I used three olives rosé vodka because it was all we have in our house. Alex's friends gave that to her as a gift. How do you probably probably three years ago? And well, I had two bottles of kettle one that I finished off and I haven't bought a new one yet. So now we started dipping into the non-regular vodka because that's all we have. So you might as well use it up. Yeah, it's almost done. A couple more Vesper martinis in it, and uh it'll be gone, and I'll have to get some real vodka again. I used Hendrix gin. I figured uh, for a British, you know, James Bond inspired thing, a London dry gym would be a good fit. Yeah. Um, and I got to thinking, what are some of the other famous cocktails that are featured in movies or other famous movie inspired cocktails that are out there? This sounds like all... a whole series of its own. Well, I just did some quick digging and I don't have any articles in front of me here or anything, but I'm just going to rattle off a couple of them because I know one of them is okay. one of your favorites and it was the French 75. That's a good and one. I guess that was from, I believe, the movie Casablanca. Okay. Um, I believe that. So I don't know if whether I've ever seen now, that movie though. You when I have to was, watch it. I haven't either. Uh, but when thinking about it, I was looking at the list and a lot of them, it didn't seem like they were all necessarily from the movies as much as the movies might have helped them become more popular or it's just kind of put some to it because one of them was like Mad Men, the old fashioned, like Mad Men didn't invent the old fashioned, but, and it's also not a movie. Yeah, it just rose in popularity but, from yeah, that. Yeah, it's just yeah. kind of that 1950s-ish sort of distinguished business man cocktail. Um it just, it fits the mold for it. But one of the top ones that I saw in all the lists that I was referencing was definitely the White Russian from the Big Lebowski. Have you seen that movie? I have not seen that movie, That's but you've referenced it quite a few times. That's a movie that I have seen quite a few times. But yeah, that's definitely, when I think movie cocktails, that's got to be up there. Second, definitely to the martinis and James Bond. Now, the James Bond martinis, a lot of people don't realize there's actually two. The Vesper martini, which is this fancy one. And then there's also the other one that's a vodka martini, shake and not stir, that famous one. That one, uh, one of the funny things about it is it's kind of a odd order because having it shaken up with the ice dilutes it. And because it's vodka martini, not gin. And what a lot of uh, people kind of allude to is that that was actually made the way it was and as an ode to James Bond being a professional and not wanting to get too buzzed when he's in the job because the water will dilute it and the vodka isn't quite as strong as the gin. Good for him. Yeah. Can't say the same for us. (laughs) (laughs) Depends on the day. Night. Depends yeah, on the night. That's true. That's true. We don't date. No we don't. Drink here. <laughs> no day drinking. We're not drinking on the job. <laughs> We're drinking on the podcast. It's different. Yeah. This it's is like the after here. work work. Yes. Absolutely. Have you? All right. So confession from uh, our last episode. I had high hopes and high dreams of making my own tortillas. That never happened. Failed. We even had some follow up, looking excited to see those tortillas, and yeah, no, nope. didn't do it. Failed. Next but time, I'm not gonna promise anything, but I will promise. I will make one promise. I will make tortillas at some point. I will not promise that it will be before the next episode. At least you make good bread. We know that, so your tortillas will probably come. I ate some of my bread tonight with that. Uh, we made a beef stew. And I had some of my no need crusty King Arthur recipe white bread that has become my favorite to make just because it's so simple and always comes out so good. It's the um, yep. 
lopped off a couple slices, popped them in the toaster for a little bit to warm them up a bit and get them nice enough. Is that your recipe? Some substance. Is that what no. we're going to talk about? Oh, okay. No. I was going to say, because I picked the soup. So if we're both going soup. Well, we came pretty close last time. We both picked like True. the same kind of bread. Although a stew and a soup are different, but we don't need to go there. No, nope. I picked a different recipe for this one. And in the spirit of Halloween, because that's all we do. I think of other things and I try to come up with themes for these podcasts. But thinking Halloween this weekend, Alex and I decided to whip up some pancakes and we didn't have any milk in the house. So we took a traditional pancake recipe not buttermilk pancakes because we didn't have buttermilk either um all we had was a little bit of heavy cream so we found a no milk pancake recipe ended up coming out really good and we took that heavy cream and diluted it for the one cup of milk or whatever they're supposed to be and it just did half of that cup was water half of it was the heavy cream sort of dilute it almost into the milk and uh then mix it up and we made some pancakes but the kicker is that we also had some Reese's cups in the house. There you go. So you put them in your chopped up a bunch of Reese's cups and put them in the pancakes. That sounds pretty great. Yep. And then we took another one for Remy and uh, we made Remy a mini pancake and put some little chopped up bacon in it. That's very, that's very um, sweet. He couldn't have the chocolate one. So he gave him bacon. Such great dog parents. I'm sure he appreciated it. <laughs> it is coming up on his, uh, fake adopted birthday in three days and one week in one week it'll be two years since we adopted him but do we know his real birthday nope so his adopted birthday is his birthday yeah so basically they told us that hey he was born october 23rd one year ago but we adopted him on october 27th and what a coincidence that the birthday they gave him just happened to be the day that he was brought into the shelter. And when we asked him, they said, yeah, we don't really know how old he is. This is kind of an estimate. <laughs> so I think they just said his birthday is the day that they uh, took him into the shelter. So he was not he's, born here. <laughs> you know, he's uh, approximately going to be three years old. Yeah. Yeah. Because he was one when we got him. And it'll be the second anniversary, birthday, adopted day, whatever. We want another one. Or there two. you do. We know it. One day. One day. When you get a house or yep. another apartment? Likely a house. I don't know if we could do a two dogs apartment. That'd be tough without a yard. Because then you'd have to take them on all kinds of walks. We already have to walk Remy for, we don't have a yard here. So we take them on four walks a day. And uh, that would be tough to do with two dogs. It's tougher to do with three dogs. But You getting a third dog? We're already going to number three. I think we might, we might just <laughs> skip the two and just get two next time. So okay. we go straight to three. There you go. We'll see. Just skip the whole step. But this is just, this is in the future. This isn't anytime soon. So, right. except you've already looked for another one. So we look <laughs> almost every day <laughs> at the local <laughs> shelter, and yeah, more in the future than he says. More sooner, sooner. Can I say? Um, so, what recipe? You already said it might be a soup. What kind of soup did you whip up for us this week? We made a classic tomato soup. And it was very good. We used the pomi strain tomatoes, which are kind of hard to find. I found them at a really random little farm, small grocer near us. But you can probably get them online. And I like those because they're already like strained for you. So you don't have to take like a ground peeled and put it in a blender. Because a lot of tomato soups, you have to actually put them in a blender to get them to that consistency. Nick, this would be perfect for you because you have no tomato chunks. So they are already out strained for you. So they have a great flavor. They've already been kind of gone through that process. So you can just pour it right in the pot. And what I did different than a lot of tomato soup recipes was that I actually added, and for anyone who hasn't watched, we do have some recipe videos on our YouTube, one of which is the tomato pesto that I actually put in the tomato soup. So at the end of the tomato soup, 
I mixed in some sun-dried tomato pesto that we handmade or homemade and some unsweetened coconut milk straight out of the can as also some chicken broth and lots of your basic spices like basil, uh, parsley, Parmesan cheese, obviously, a little red pepper for spice, olive oil, and we all, lots of garlic. And then we also bought a loaf of garlic ciabatta bread, which is this, that the farm near us occasionally has this ciabatta bread that actually has like whole cloves of roasted garlic in the bread. So when you slice it, you're actually biting into like full cloves of roasted garlic. So I put butter all over the two sides of the bread and Parmesan cheese, threw it in the oven and then cut it up and actually made it into little ciabatta, like croutons almost. Put them in the soup. It was very good. You know, it's funny. We made a white bean soup last week. It was last week. It might've been two weeks ago now, but we made a white bean soup that was also a tomato based. It wasn't a tomato soup, but there was tomato in the broth. And we did the same. We had the chunky, the ground peeled tomatoes and we threw them in a blender, chop them all up. Yep. So there weren't the chunks in them. You would love uh, strained ones. But that was also when we made that rosemary focaccia. And I did basically the same thing as you did. We had some stale focaccia that was, uh, you know, a day or two old, getting a little hard. So we chopped it up and turned it into croutons and put that in with it and also had it with salads. And if you haven't heard the reason that we, I mentioned the tomatoes was because Nick is afraid of chunky tomatoes. So he refuses to eat them. I do have an aversion to chunky sauce. tomatoes. He won't eat burrata with tomatoes. He won't eat the tomatoes. So he'll only eat them if they are pureed. Gotta be smooth. Smooth. <laughs> smooth. Very weird quirk. He'll eat pretty much everything else though. Mm. No. I don't know of anything else that you don't eat. Yeah, there's not much. It really isn't much. That's it? Ah, I, I don't prefer stuff like... You know what I won't eat that I absolutely refuse to eat? Cheesecake. No, the right cheesecake will do. Uh, those weird fake imitation meats. Like the impossible well, meats. I mean, those just aren't... They're just... Yeah, they're just not that great. Okay. Hey, you said I'll eat just about anything. I won't eat that I stuff. Mean, I haven't even, I've had it one time and it obviously was, it was like fine. But if I can eat real meat, I'm not a vegetarian or a vegan. So Alex recently bought these things that uh, her family's been making. They're called chicken nuggets, but it's not chicken. It's oh chicken. yeah, the apostrophe, the little yep. apostrophe. Oh yeah. C-H-I-K apostrophe N nuggets i've seen those she cooked them she's like oh these are okay you should try one i'm like first of all that's not a glowing review okay these are okay <laughs> uh definitely not something i'm going to stretch out of my comfort zone for and any of that impossible stuff i just i don't want to touch it why eat it what i don't understand is you know usually the reason someone's eating is because they are vegan or they're vegetarian hear? Uh, like why do they still put chicken in the name like why do you still want the meat name in it if you're trying to like make a point i think it was nestle one yeah. of those food companies actually just came out and they're doing the same thing they're making like an imitation vegan shrimp that actually looks and it's supposed to taste imitation like real shrimp shrimp but it's in like the shape of like actual shrimp it's like along the same lines it's like if you're so opposed to meat why are you making things that look like that meat yes. they're also making vegan eggs do they have shells vegan eggs and shrimp oh, they tyson. Also already make beef and chicken tyson embraces alternate shrimp made from plants i don't know how that's possible look at this stuff here like why why? It looks just like shrimp. I mean, it's the same shape as shrimp. That's all covered in all kinds of. If stuff. you're listening and you are a lover of imitation meats and you have some uh, tips for us or you disagree with this, let us know because I would be genuinely curious. 
or stop listening because we're not the company for you. <laughs> if you can cook it the same, like I just, you know, I'm sure you can make it so it's pretty good. But no matter what, I feel like if you did the same recipe side by side, just like if you did it with tofu, it just doesn't have the same flavors. You don't get the fat in it. You don't get the fat content. You don't get the same oils, like the natural, the natural bite you get in meat. I had a two day stretch last week where I was convinced I was going to start eating keto diet. So I went out and I got these things called like miracle noodles. They're shirataki noodles and they're clear and they are made of the special, whatever, non, not, it's like a, it's like a real thin flour or whatever that holds up to like 95% water to weight ratio or something crazy i don't know uh hard to i don't really know what it is so it's hard to describe but what i can describe is the fact that when i cooked it and you eat it it like snaps like you're biting into like a water balloon well that's like, like you when... would eat it and it was like like it would pop and it would crunch it's like weird so they have yeah. those have zucchini in them and that's kind of why shirataki like... noodles those ones aren't zucchini noodles is a different thing. Website. All right. Oh, wait. No, that's just a recipe that they're recommending. Okay, Got it. Right. They have, it but seems like, like they have say, various ones. I've had many times, I've had d- many different types of zoodles, like the zucchini noodles. And I just think they're always a little soggy. They don't, it just doesn't hold up to pasta. You can't hold up to pasta. No. No way. That's why pasta is pasta. It's true. That's like we, there was this one time we tried making this pizza with like a sweet potato crust like we made this dough out of sweet potato it was basically just rolling out sweet potato and we cooked it and like i, I like the flavor it, it was like potato. it was inedible it was bad it was very bad but i feel like sweet potato has its own flavor so if you make it with pizza unless you're making a pizza with complimentary flavor well we did sweet potato and it was like a barbecue chicken pizza we gave it a chance. That was like as good as it was going to get for it, but it just, it wasn't good. Cauliflower, not cauliflower, uh, sweet potato pizza crust is just not the same as white flour, no pizza crust. Can't compare. Your miracle rather... noodles remind me of like a pad thai noodle. You know how they're like, so I'm looking at pictures. You know how they're so like almost see-through, like they're usually a little more clear than like yep. a yeah, like these ones, they, they're actually, like, they're fully see-through. They were clear. Weird. I'm going to have to try them just to see. Now I'm curious. They're in that, like, tofu organic section in the supermarket. I don't know. Try them. See what you like. We mixed them up with something. Some kind of sauce, but they weren't very good. Couldn't do them. It's worth Wouldn't trying. do them again. That's all I'll oh, say. Everything's worth trying a few times. Everything's <laughs> worth trying twice. I'll try it once. I'll try it again. If I still don't like it the second time, I'm not going to try it a third time. Well, you know it's not the noodles if the rest of your dish tastes good. So if the flavors in the dish are good. Yeah, we had it alongside. That's how you know. We had it alongside some ahi tuna. With some, Always uh, good. With some spicy mayo that we made. Well, then at least you got that. Yeah, that was pretty good. It's the same thing with cauliflower rice. I mean, it's it's just not rice. Yeah. No. It's too light. It's just not the same. Nope. I made, today I made a uh, cilantro lime rice. That was good. It ended up coming out really good. Love cilantro. Heavy on so the cilantro. To all the haters out there who think it tastes like toothpaste, I disagree. Soap. Soap. <laughs> Soap. That's Soap. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I don't know. If it's soapy, I still love it. It's not. It tastes like fresh herbs, but it's a weird thing. It maybe it's genetic. It is. I think that's a been proven. Some people are genetically opposed to eating <laughs> cilantro. It tastes weird to them. And I get it. I mean, if it tastes bad to you, it tastes bad to you. It's just it doesn't taste bad to me. It's delicious. Never had it in anything that it was too much or that it ruined the flavors at all. But. And even though you went off track with uh, your cocktail today, didn't make it with rum, which I thought you were, I really thought you would do it. 
I almost didn't. I almost forgot, and I did. Well, I'm glad but you did. They're One a very meeting been. rum because we're going into our interview with Three of Strong. So I'm going to segue by saying they're a merry meeting rum. Nick gave it to me last year for Christmas, I think, right? He gave it to me in like a cocktail basket. Yep. It is very good. It has great flavor and it's a spiced rum. So it's perfect in the hot toddy. It has a like great flavor on its own. But when you mix it with all those other like spicy or not spicy, but those warm spice type flavors and we get into that in this episode, it's very good. So if you can get your hands on Three of Strong, and I saw on their website, they're actually delivering to a lot more states now. So if you're not in Mass, um, or I don't even think they deliver to Mass, but I can go drive and buy it or Nick can get it for me, uh, you can order it. So check it out on their website. Maybe they're within shipping distance or driving distance for you. It's definitely worth the trip. But Merry Meeting, great fall winter run. All of their rums are delicious. So that's I, that's the only rum that I really have in our apartment right now, at least in a, as far as ones that I've gone out and bought just because they're my local and they're uh, my favorite. So I have the Mara meeting always on my shelf. And I also have the bright water, for like a classic white uh, rum. But I also, I really want to try out that agricole, the Acadian yep. or the current, the Oak to Acadian is the current expression of it that they have. Uh, and we'll get into more of that in this podcast. So listen up and uh, get yourself out to Three of Strong. Get yourself out to your local liquor store and pick up some bottles of that. Uh, with that said, let's get us into the podcast with Three of Strong. Welcome, everyone, to the Uncle's Corner Podcast. Today, we're excited to be re-welcoming on Three of Strong, Graham and Rachel. So Rachel is a, a new, so why don't we have you introduce yourself first, and then we'll have Graham reintroduce himself to all of our listeners. Hello, I'm Rachel. Um, I am the lead bartender slash social media slash marketing slash sales slash whatever they need me to do. Um, reorganized the office the other day. <laughs> um, and I have been at Three of Strong Spirits since the beginning, and I'm really excited to be here with you guys to talk about it. And I am Graham. I am the lead distiller here, uh, producing all the tasty rums that we're going to be talking about today. I've uh, been here since the beginning of uh, the inception of Three of Strong, which is now just over two years. Uh, it's been a wonky couple years, but uh, we're making it through it, so we're excited to be here. And... Like I just said before we kick this off here, Bianca hears it all the time. You're one of my favorite spots to go to in Portland. Me and my girlfriend go all the time uh, and sit out there on your deck and have some cocktails. So tell us a little bit about what you guys have to offer for anyone listening. Uh, whether I know food trucks are always there. Lucky Lou's is one of my favorites to go to and get there. Um, and then cocktails out in the deck. I think I saw recently you had some live music going on there as well. Yeah, we're getting the, the events back up and running uh, for the winter. Um, hopefully we'll get a bunch bunch more live music going. We've got some fun events with like Charcut Marie, who actually does the charcuterie boards that we serve at the distillery. So it's a build your own board night. We've got Sip and Script coming in for a drink rum and learn how to do calligraphy night. So lots of events and we're working on the fall menu now. So lots of new cocktails to come. And uh, speaking of that, cocktails, rum cocktails specifically, is the reason we brought you guys on today. You are the experts. And I know from the cocktails that we've had in person there to the ones that you guys send out and you can now buy around the stores, those uh, pre-bottled cocktails, the ready-to-go ones, they're all delicious. So tell us a little bit about, well, let me start with that because last time we talked, I don't think you were really distributing those yet. They were just uh, kits. People could order and go pick them up from the distillery, right, to make their own cocktails at home. So tell us a little bit about those uh, pre-bottled cocktails you guys offer. Yeah, so it kind of started out as a like, how can we continue to serve people without a bar during COVID or during the height of COVID? Um, and that's where the kits came from. And I think the ready to drink were kind of always something that Sam and Dave wanted to do. Um, and so we kind of transitioned with two things that we served. We had a mold cider um, that we're about to bring back as well now that it's starting to get cold. Um, and then our hibiscus lime rum punch, which was one of the... Um, like original punches kind of we made here when I started anyways. Um, and so we just 
threw it in bottles and, and now it's available. Now you can get our cocktails, not just at the distillery, which is really exciting. Yep. <laughs> so a little Bow Street and where else is it available now? Old, does Old Port Spirit still Old have Port it? it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and in addition to the RTDs, one of the other fun things we've been doing is uh, keg cocktails. Uh, so things like our mojito, um, we've been batching that and kegging that and keg conditioning that to carb it. And there's a handful of restaurants in town that are carrying that now. Uh, Nosh, uh, the zoo, Luke's Lobster. And that's been, uh, again, one of those things that kind of was birthed out of the whole COVID thing, just trying to get, uh, you know, keep things moving and keep uh, our rum flowing. And you mentioned uh, mulled cider. What, what is actually in a mulled cider? I don't think I've ever had one. So a mulled cider is like essentially just a cider that you cook down with mulling spices, which is a bunch of warm spices. Usually there's like orange, vanilla, um, cardamom, cinnamon. I don't know if there's usually cardamom actually, or if we just throw it in because we love cardamom here. <laughs> um, what else is it? It's been a while since I've made it. Clove, star anise, cinnamon, allspice, basically the, you know, basically everything that tastes like fall and baked goods and feels like it should be in an apple pie. Um, you cook it down with the cider. Um, and you can also do it with um, a buttered rum to make it even more luscious, which is my favorite way of doing it. <laughs> or you can just throw in some rum in there. Um, Usually you heat the, heat the cider first, show the spices, heat the cider, throw it all in there and then add the rum so you don't cook off the yummy, yummy alcohol. And which of your rums would you say has the most like fall flavor notes on its own that you would one, recommend just sipping it on the rocks or mixing it into your cider? Oh, that would probably the have marinating. to be the marinating. <laughs> yes, our, our spice drum, that's uh it lends itself well for the holiday spirits. Basically uh, every holiday season, we almost sell out of it. Yeah. People are just enamored of it for the holiday season, as am I, they're correct. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that, that's a good one. Cause yeah, that one just automatically goes into a, a cider perfectly and it just almost creates a, a mouth cider. That one's always on my bottle rack. That's uh, one of our favorite quick, easy throw together cocktails to dark and stormy. Um, that we make with that. So merry meeting I always have, and then bright water I have as well as our white rum in the house. And that's what I put together today with your recipe on your website in the cocktail recipe section, the bright water daiquiri, um, which is another favorite that we get when we show up there in person. Uh, but we can make them at home now as well. So, <laughs> And daiquiri is how you tell a good white rum. If it doesn't taste good in a daiquiri or a mojito, then it's not a good white rum. Mm -hmm. It's been nice and simple. You can still taste the rum without it being like, you know, a crazy tiki drink that's essentially just a bunch of juice. Not that I don't love crazy tiki drinks. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of, uh, I guess, crazy tiki drinks, you guys had at least this summer a lot of frozen cocktails that you were putting out, uh, specials in there. So, where are all these cocktail recipes coming from? You mentioned you were the bartender and kind of you do everything there, but you're, as I understand it, the one that comes up with a lot of these recipes, right? I have been traditionally, um, especially when we were a smaller staff, now that we have more people, they're like, can I come up with drinks? And I'm like, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> a certain amount of fatigue. Um, but usually it's just kind of, um, I always try to be inspired by like what's seasonal to a certain extent, because um, my attention deficit will kick in if I have no focal point. So like what's seasonal is usually a good one, or if there's a specific rum we want to feature. Um, as a starting off point. Um, the blended drinks were a bit of a, an internal struggle because any bartender who's worked with a blender before knows that it can be a real big pain in the butt um, and to clean it out. And people always want the blended drink as soon as they see it. Um, so we always limited ourselves to one blended drink at a time so that we didn't have to continuously wash the blender. Um, but it's, it's always, I don't know. Blend. I also lived in Key West for a number of years, so blended drinks like are kind of triggering with just like, oh God, someone's gonna vomit. <laughs> <laughs> but the blended drinks were a lot of fun. And I also saw that you have um, you have the working title, which I had just seen. And Nick's gonna have to go in and taste it because it says it's in your tasting room. It looks really interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about what to expect from that? Yeah, so the, the, the working title series is sort of the, the playground 
for me, I guess, to kind of do small batch stuff and kind of uh, do some some zany things that I probably wouldn't otherwise normally do. Uh, so this is our volume two. Our first one that was uh, released oh, about a year and a half or so ago was our sort of an agricole inspired rum using uh, raw cane juice. And then that went on to become our Acadian rum. Uh, so this is our, our volume two, which is our aged rum, which is 100% molasses based, uh, aged in uh, new charred oak barrels for about eight months. Um, and then I finished that, transferred that liquid over to an ex-white wine barrel and an ex-apple brandy barrel. And it was originally intended to be a, our kind of our first birthday uh, anniversary release, uh, but COVID kind of put a kibosh on that. Uh, so it ended up sitting in, in the barrels uh, till about just a couple months ago. So it's uh, full, almost two years aged. Um, but the, those flavors that the rum extracted from the white wine barrel and the apple brandy barrel really just kind of played together so well. Uh, you get some of that nice bright apple flavors, but a little bit more of the, uh, the white wine lends itself to kind of grounding it and giving it a kind of almost an earthiness, you know, almost reminiscent to like maybe a dry sherry of sorts. So it's a really dynamic rum. Uh, limited release. I think we only put up about 300 bottles. So uh, get them while you can. Get it while you can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to jump right on it. That sounds delicious. It's so good. It's been actually a pain in the butt to come up with cocktails for because every time I mix anything with it, I'm like, but the rum is just so good on its own, which is usually a struggle here, but this one particularly. So I think it's because it's also so unique, especially in the rum world. Like I've never tasted a rum that tastes anything like this. Um, but I've been doing a little bit of like trying with cognac and Calvados style cocktails, like old school pre-prohibition era where there's like not much in it, just kind of enough to like bump up the initial flavors of that rum. It's so good. I definitely get that. There's, I'm big into whiskey as well. That's uh, one of my top drinks. So when you have a nice whiskey or a really nice uh, anything, any sort of liquor for that matter, you don't really want to mix it in with something else because it's always tastes so good just stand alone and so on so that would be tough but i'm sure you can figure it out <laughs> you got some. that's right you're creative <laughs> you're the expert <laughs> i believe last time we we chatted on our previous episode we asked grim what uh his favorite cocktail was and the answer was just straight up <laughs> yep. that's yep. exactly whenever people come into the um, distillery and they're like I'm gonna buy a bottle like what would you mix with this I'm like ice <laughs> maybe yeah. 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 Out. if you had to pick your favorite child which is the favorite rum in general that you guys each have Ooh. Ooh, <laughs> I have several answers to this question <laughs> I'll hear um, several answers that's fine <laughs> the stone pier is probably like my go-to like workhorse kind of like if people were to get one bottle at three of straw like one bottle of rum for their bar i would suggest the stone pier because it's got the it's a blend of the five-year colombian aged rum and our bright water silver rum so it can do the like light um bright you know daiquiri style cocktails but then it can also do like old-fashioned it can also do painkillers it can really like it plays all positions um probably my favorite is the Acadian, which is the working title one. And I always call it our foster sale because it was supposed to be a single batch and then we in, it immediately became one of our products. Um, but we're out of that at the moment. So I guess the aged version, the Oaked Acadian is yeah. my favorite, which is what I'm drinking right now. <laughs> yeah. But that will probably change. Like if you asked me in 45 minutes, I'd probably be like, well, the night water. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you're feeling, yeah. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah I feel like my, my preference and favorite kind of change in the season, but uh, I do find myself always kind of gravitating back towards the Oak Acadian. Uh, it's just a very unique rum being, uh, you know, made from raw cane juice. It was aged in our X rum barrels. Uh, so it has, you know, it's just a very different take and especially something that you wouldn't necessarily see coming from uh, up here in Maine, typically, so. Yeah, I was trying to, when we first did the Acadian, I was trying to figure out if there were any distilleries that were doing agricoles this far north. And I think I found one in Minnesota, 
that was doing like an agricole style, but they were using cane syrup instead of the cane juice. So I was like, mm -mm, that doesn't count. No. Nope. <laughs> Even if it did, you have a close enough bubble between here and Minnesota that I think you guys have the lock on that market. <laughs> yeah, we've had a good amount of rums. We've tried a good amount. And I, I think yours has a lot of really distinct flavors. It's really, all of them have been really unique. Nick's always bringing me different things to try. And it definitely stands out in terms of the flavor notes that you get and the complexity of it. It's really cool because like just starting out with rum, I mean, most people are drinking really cheap, not great rums. Uh, so when you take that step up to something that's a little bit more sophisticated, it really makes a difference and you're able to drink it and really appreciate its flavors. Yeah, that's uh, it's one of my targets is to always have a rum in the bottle that you can enjoy just neat or just with a, an ice cube or something like that, but it's not necessarily intended to mix. Like I think some rums are sort of designed for that purpose for mixing kind of only. Uh, so everything that's in the bottle is something that I feel can stand proudly on its own. Definitely can. And that's been a, a big struggle for me too, introducing other people that aren't big drinkers to more cocktails like my girlfriend's family specifically whenever we're together I'm making something and uh I'll you know we have we've had a few cocktail artists on and I'll go to the books we have a book up there and I'll pick one okay let's do this one here and I'll throw it together with some real you know rum something from you guys or something and then everyone's oh what about Malibu like, mm, no <laughs> <laughs> it hurts um but yeah having the uh having a really really good base liquor and it always improves the cocktail and uh or you could just you know drinking it straight so like i said you keep coming back to this as a whiskey guy the parchando 12 is a phenomenal one for me because the aging on that just gives it such a great flavor and then mixing it up with a traditional cocktail like an old-fashioned it's just a nice spin on it that isn't what you're used to but it's you know great on it's you know in a different way yeah, that one, uh, I think, converts a lot of the, the whiskey drinkers or the, the ones that are have the, you know, we always hear people, oh, I can't drink rum, I had a bad experience, or it's too sweet, or one of those things, and you can kind of usually nudge them to try that. You say, oh, well, it's been aged in X bourbon barrels, and they're like, oh, oh, okay, well, I'll try that, and then their eyes light up, and they're like, wow, I didn't know a rum could actually taste like this, so, yeah, that one helps uh, convert a lot of non-rum drinkers to to enjoy the rums and i think i saw on your website that you have that one in a ready to go ready to drink cocktail form now as well right parchando yep no we have a new special on for part of our community spirits uh, we do um our monthly specials um always we we started this program early in the summer kind of accidentally and now every month we choose an or a local organization where two dollars from each of our specials goes to that local organization and I just put on one with the Chondo um, and that's probably what I saw <laughs> <laughs> now I recently I had bring the Chondo no. into one of the ready to drinks <laughs> would, be, would be a little too because the ready to drinks have to be a certain um, ABV yep something I struggle with because I'm someone who prefers to drink my spirits, you know, neat. Um, so getting it to that 8% ABV sometimes is a struggle. And I feel like Chondo is definitely one where it's just like, you don't want to mix that much juice with it. <laughs> so is that just when it comes to the wording or whatever, in order for you to sell it as a ready to drink cocktail, it has to fall under that. So what would stop you from mixing that up and just selling it as a rum at a higher ABV? Are you not allowed to do that? Uh, we, we could do that. Uh, there is a lot of kind of legal mumbo jumbo that you have to go through between formula approval and uh, label design and everything. It's kind of, it's a, a big speed bump a lot of times for something that, uh, you know, until you can really prove the success, there's a lot of sort of effort or pre-effort to get to that point. Uh, and then the other thing is always uh, shelf stability. All of our cocktails uh, are, and even the RTDs, the ready to drink bottles are all, you know, all natural, no preservatives, fresh ingredients. So uh, we do have a, you know, a recommended drink by date on every bottle. So uh, 
uh, and that's sort of how we like to approach things is keep things as natural as possible, no preservatives, artificial colors, phases, that sort of stuff. So uh, having that as an extra kind of hurdle to get over in the process sort of uh, sometimes limits us, but uh, you know, we do what we can with it and the 8% the EBV thing and that sort of helps us if we keep it at that point, we can have uh, distribution so we don't have to go through a distributor uh, which, you know, obviously takes uh, their own cut of the pie. And, uh, so keeping around 8% from a business standpoint, is uh, those are the kind of the reasons why. I can promise you I've never passed the ready-to-drink date on any of the ready-to-drink cocktails that I've gotten from you guys. Well, I was at my parents' house a couple of weeks ago, and I discovered a bottle of the mold cider in the back of their liquor cabinet. I was like, <laughs> hey, this is supposed to be refrigerated. B, we haven't sold this since May. <laughs> 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 I was slightly tempted to see what it would like smell like, but no. Extra aging in the bottle. <laughs> yeah. Now there's one question that I have. So we've talked about citrus a lot. We've talked about fruits on here, especially with cocktails and cocktail infusions and making your own syrups and all sorts of things. And you get a lot of those fruity flavors and a lot of beverages and especially with rum in the summertime I and mean, you're making some incredible fruity beverages like we talked about. But one thing that I feel like people are a little bit more scared of, or maybe it's just me, I'm not sure, is mixing herbs in their cocktails. And I was at a restaurant a couple months ago and they made me a cocktail that was really heavy on oregano and it was surprisingly one of the best cocktails that I felt that I'd ever had just because the flavor was so different. So I've been playing around with this at home and it was our signature drink at our wedding had the oregano in it. And I saw that you had a cocktail with, I believe it was thyme sprig on your menu. So you're playing around with herbs. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is like in terms of flavor and how people can kind of open up to those new flavor profiles? Yeah, it's always a lot of fun um, to kind of play with an herb that you don't associate. Like rosemary, I feel like it's pretty standard. People are like, yeah, rosemary and gin, rosemary and a cocktail, like no problem. But then to get into kind of more of those savory elements or something that like is evocative of, a, of one of the savory elements. I did the thyme because I was trying not to use rosemary. It was legitimately just like, I was like, <laughs> all right, I'm going to try thyme now. <laughs> We're going to move on. But I love herbaceous. Like if we're talking, you know, wine, cocktails, food, anything kind of like herbal and aromatic like that, I love those flavors. And one of the things, so when I started at Three of Strong, uh, my knowledge base was very, you know, prohibition, pre-prohibition era style cocktails, like, you know, the three ingredient cocktails, the classic, serve in a coupe, not too frilly, which is like the opposite of tiki, which is what I think a lot of people associate with rum. So one of the things that I really enjoyed about learning more about rum cocktails and tiki drinks in general was the way in which flavors that you don't necessarily associate as going together go together, like warm spices and fruit and tropical fruits. Even though when you think about it, you're like, yeah, of course that makes sense. That's where all the warm spices come from. Is those tropical places that the fruits come from. And so I just, it was kind of like a pivot into um, doing that with herbs too. So the, that cocktail that you're talking about was also my first time making a shrub, which is a lot of fun um, and is also a really great way to get like kind of natural preservatives into, um, into drinks to make it make a little bit more shelf stable. So that might be ma making its way into one of our ready to drinks in the future. Stay tuned. Um, but yeah, it, so it was vinegar, and I put a little bit of balsamic vinegar in there. So balsamic vinegar, mostly champagne vinegar, strawberries and thyme. Um, so it was definitely that kind of like sweet, savory, fruity, acidic, and hope, and luckily it balanced out. It was actually kind of an accident that I happened to have some strawberry infused rum left over from June and the strawberry thyme shrub that I was like, maybe we'll throw this into a keg. And I literally just poured it all that I had of those two ingredients together and it ended up being perfect. <laughs> Worked wonderfully. Worked wonderfully. We sold out of that cocktail in about, I think, three days. Wow. That, it also helped that I named it after a Monty Python. Uh, Strawberry the shrubber, right? Yeah. That's it? <laughs> I said that to like four different people here and they were like, what are you talking about? I was like, well, I'm not friends with you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the Holy Grail joke then. <laughs> 
So you mentioned the mold cider. What are some other fall cocktails or seasonal specific? I shouldn't just say fall as we're transitioning kind of out of the summer, out of the really heavy fruity flavors. What are some of the other things that we can expect to taste in your tasting room in the coming months? That's an excellent question because we're working on that right now. <laughs> um, I can say one of our big focuses last year was getting as many hot drinks onto the menu as we could because we had, didn't have any indoor seating um, due to you know COVID restrictions. This year, we might not be quite as heavy on the, uh, on the hot drinks. Basically our whole menu got taken over by them. Um, which there was, it was, I was impressed with our ability to um, maintain um, kind of diversity within that and not just do a bunch of toddy variations. So I will not knock a toddy. Um, but I feel like everyone always associates fall with those warm spices that go so well with, um, with rum and with the tropical flavors. Um, so I know, let's see, our next special is going to be a lemongrass infused oak decadian with lemon balm tea and peach bitters. So it's going to be very kind of like fruity, but nice and um, dry as well. Um, it's always, it's always, you don't want to lean too heavily into like the gingerbread and, <laughs> and that again, warm spice, like that pumpkin spice. You don't want to fall down the, you know, pumpkin spice black hole. Um, but at the end of the day, a lot of the spices in pumpkin spice are really good with rum. <laughs> so you might see a pumpkin spice drink, but hopefully not. Has there, been, has there been on your menu last year a variation of like a, uh, like, I guess like an Irish coffee with rum, like a coffee with rum? I feel like rum and coffee, coffee could go together pretty well. Yeah, so there's a very, um, it's like traditional, I think, Spanish uh, coffee and booze and very often coffee and rum drink, Carajillo, which we've had variations of on our menu. Um, we had one with um, the merry meeting, because um, that goes great with coffee, and it was just merry meeting, sweetened condensed milk and coffee, pretty much. It was like a really lovely kind of almost espresso martini kind of style thing. Um, we haven't done a hot coffee one yet. Um, but we do have a, one of our neighbors in East Bayside is a coffee roastery, coffee by design, um, and we've been we're, we've been talking to them about doing a doing a coffee collab. So I like the idea of making it making it Irish a little bit. <laughs> 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 or what would that be? Making it Colombian. We can make it Colum that's like Colombian coffee, Colombian rum. Like <laughs> there we go. New drink there on the go. menu. <laughs> Brought to you by the Four Corner help. Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Nick has been pretty good at uh, mixing up his own cocktails. I think he's becoming a little bit of a mixologist on his own time. He's you made what did you make, Nick? It was he's made espresso martinis, but you did make an Irish cocktail that was pretty good. Irish coffee that was pretty good. Yeah, but that wasn't my recipe. That was like Google. That was a Google special. You Google that one. The key lime pie martini was a pretty good one. <laughs> that one. Yes. Um, Again, more Google, little spins for me. The only cocktail that I can think of that I made myself was taking a dirty martini and instead of doing the olives and olive juice, I did pickled jalapenos with the juice from that, which isn't really, uh, I don't know, that's not straying too far from the original, but that was the only, I guess, Nick Plumbo original <laughs> cocktail that I could think of. Anytime I've ever seen a like dirty martini with any sort of spiciness, it's always called a hot and dirty. I hadn't heard that, no. Usually I've seen it more as a dirty martini with Tabasco added to it, which people have ordered from me and I refuse to make them. <laughs> <laughs> but I, li I like much more the like spicy pepper brine. Yeah, it was good. You know, it was pretty good. Nick will that's do anything really... to add spice. I know. <laughs> that's, his, that's, I gotta... his, uh, that's his thing. <laughs> it's my crutch. I got to kick that. But... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right is a, <laughs> one of the specials we have right now is a pepper infused um, stone pier rum with just lemon juice and angostura as a like, kind of highball style. Um, so peppers are a really fun kind of like summer to fall flavor as well because um, ours are all smoked. So they got that nice smokiness, but they still have the like, again, fruitiness. Um, I always like, like people kind of forget that how like bright and citrusy peppers can be when they're fresh and then how it's like, that's one thing that I've found a lot of with um, 
making some of my own hot sauces and adding peppers to things, something like a habanero. Like there's a lot more to it than just spice. You do get a lot of sweets out of it if you do them up right. Yeah, we did a habanero at one point and it was too spicy for me. So <laughs> I, <with> that one. <laughs> I like the guajillos. They're nice and just like there's a little bit in there, but not enough to. They basically just gave it like a nice, smoky, dry, earthy, um, which I feel like are always good. In the, it's always difficult in the fall because you kind of want to make things spicy because like that you feel like the heat is good. But then you're like, but spicy foods make you sweat, which cool you down. So maybe not cooling people down <laughs> when it's getting cold out. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to get a fall. I went outside to walk my dog the other night and I stepped outside in a T-shirt. And I felt that cold, like winter air and someone had a fire going on nearby. I could smell it. I'm like, oh man, it's winter already. No fall this year. <laughs> yeah, we were in shorts and a t-shirt, I think just a few days ago. And yeah. now i am got my, my heavy duty hoodie <laughs> on. And... I, I unpacked my wool socks. <laughs> Change is quick. <laughs> So how do you, in the in this season change, since it is getting cooler, uh, what are some of your favorite, I know you did say you're just getting back into events, so I probably, maybe, maybe not a question that you'll really have much of an answer to, but what are some of your favorite things to do in the fall for visitors who are coming in outside of like specialty drinks? Is the events that you're having, are they, you know, you have like the live music and things like that, but are you having any of those that are more seasonal? Well, there's the Halloween East Bayside block party yep. that's happening that I'm really excited about because I love Halloween. Um, I want to dress Graham up like a mad scientist and uh, just have him be like in his laboratory. <laughs> <laughs> Some goggles and a lab coat. Like the it. beard's already there. I don't think it would be too difficult to make him look like a mad scientist. You could pull it off. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta come That's up important. with a, some sort of neon green rum that he can be serving as well yes done done yes peas i did it <laughs> <laughs> remember that bright green thing oh no and that was technically the portage though that was the gin and it actually had uh tarragon. still works still works exactly and it was mm. neon green yeah. um we like gin too yeah we do well i always i like to Sask and call it a botanical rum instead of calling it a gin. <laughs> it's technically true. Yeah. It. <laughs> and what are you going to be for Halloween at this block party? Oh, I'm a witch. Witch? That's what I used to tell my little cousins when they were when they were babies that that's what I did for a living is that I was a witch. <laughs> nice. I mean, I have potions. Yeah. You, got your <laughs> you do. Mix them up. We have a uh, <laughs> recurring guest in our podcast, Julia Hadas. That's a cocktail uh, cocktail artist, I guess, and she is a practicing witch. And she her first book that she releases witchcraft cocktails. So all of her cocktails that mixed down. together. Yeah, it's it's a really good one. And uh, we're having her back on soon as well with her new book. But all of her cocktails, she looks at the ingredients in them and puts them together based on there's the energies and the different things that you can get out of them outside of just flavor so we start doing that as well you're right there it'll fit right in with the witch costume. <laughs> i definitely have to get that book because there's a really great book called the thirsty botanist mm. which is basically that kind of thing but it's from a um, botanist the perspective of a botanist she was a trained botanist and she got really into bartending and she worked with a friend of hers who was kind of the opposite he was a bartender who had gotten into botany um, and it's, that's one of the things that sometimes I'll do when I'm like looking for inspiration is I'll just like rifle through that book because it has a bunch of like herbs and spices that you're just like, oh yeah, that's a thing. <laughs> and apparently it's very cleansing or apparently it's good for your skin or it's always, it's always fun to have those little tidbits for like Perfect. cocktail. It helps also beef up the menu a little bit too. You can help sell your stuff. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so for this block party, because I'm definitely going to be going to this now. When is it? And uh, who else is participating? Because you guys have a lot of places around you. I know uh, right where you're at behind you, you got Lone Pine, Rising Tide, Austin Street. They're all right there. Is this that whole area down there and the water going to be? Can gather on the, uh, on the Slack channel. Um, it's pretty much the whole neighborhood. I think all the way up to Washington Ave. Um, 
but it's, it lo it's looking like it's going to be an amazing, amazing event. There's different places are kind of doing their own thing a little bit, but it's all going to happen, I believe, on the 30th, because that's the Saturday. Um, and it's, I think there are going to be a bunch of food trucks in. Basically, there's this whole like channel right now of people being like, I'm a food truck, like, where should I go? And different distilleries and breweries being like, we'll take you. I think some people are planning on having music. Um, I want to do a haunted house in which I dress Graham up like a mad scientist. Did I mention this yet? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, please put this in the podcast so that I can say that we're doing this. Like, now he has to. No, I'll have to. Yeah, I'll be committed. If it's yes. advertised. <laughs> Well, I'm glad glad we got to fit it in there. We're gonna hold you to it. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> we want pictures. Pictures are proof. Yeah. <laughs> so at the very least, it's a good Instagram post. That is true. Definitely a good Instagram post. <laughs> Potion in hand. So for everyone listening, before we wrap, is there anything else that you would like to share that's coming out? And then let us know where they can all find and keep up with you online and on social media. Uh, let's see. For for spirits right now, uh, it, it's yet to be determined. But our uh, portage gin or botanical rum, as some people like to call it, <laughs> uh, it's sitting in some barrels right now. So we actually have a an okay gin uh, sitting. But uh, it's again, it's probably going to be probably working title volume three uh being an age product it's really tough to tell when that's going to be ready but that could be uh coming uh coming online between now and probably springtime so keep checking back on our social media avenues which i'm sure rachel <laughs> has a better idea than i do yes um, well we're three of strong spirits on instagram um got a facebook page um, we've got a youtube channel which is very exciting what do you um, put out on the youtube channel uh, well, if you give me this recording, I'll put it on there. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, All yours. A, we've got a couple of different things and stuff that we did with uh, Spirit Hub, which is a direct-to-consumer um, shipping, uh, like alcohol shipper. I don't know distributor. Distributor. Yeah. There's the word um, that they did. A, I think it was Graham and Dave did a couple different vignettes with them. There's a couple different videos. Um, cocktail instruction from me. And then um, we've also got some... Um, history videos on there from Jeff Lyons, who does Portland walk, walking tours. Um, so it's the history of rum in Portland. Um, and those, we had, I post those once every couple months, um, but there are a couple on there, more to come. Um, we do have a new ready to drink coming out. The mulled cider will be coming back. Um, and then we have the, um, I want to call it Pina Mate or Pina Mate, because it kind of looks like pirate. But it's a pineapple mate, uh, stone pier, my favorite one. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, a little lime juice, Angostura, um, if you, uh, grapes and fresh nutmeg on top. It's ab absolutely wonderful. Um, it's also a kind of really great example of those tropical flavors being able to translate into colder seasons because the earthiness from the mate and the spice from the Angostura and that nice um, kind of clove and spice from the, from the stone pier. Um, all come together nicely so it's like it's good in the spring summer fall winter um, and then we just we're gonna have a lot of specials coming out soon whole new fall menu I'm hoping we bring some buttered rum back because buttered rum is my favorite because how can you make alcohol better add butter, add butter. <laughs> it works definitely works and if you get that ready by Halloween you can dress someone up like a pirate and have them for that as well Graham, you could pull off pirate too. <laughs> yeah, I could do a pirate. Yeah. Sam's Sam's gonna claim pirate. Sam's taking a pirate already. Uh, Sam Purse, one of our owners, uh, has more than one pirate costume. <laughs> Ready to go. Ready there to you go. go. Yeah. <laughs> make people walk the plank. If they make it to the other side, they get a free shot of your uh, <laughs> the rum. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, we had a blast talking to you. We'll definitely get you this link so you can share it everywhere. And uh, we'll include links to your social and everything for our listeners to go check you guys out. And I will be in soon to come try working title volume two before it's gone. And uh, I'm sure many other cocktails that you guys are going to have up coming out in this fall menu. But thanks a lot again. And cheers. Cheers. cheers for having us. Forgot that last time. I had to make sure I included it.
<laughs> Have a good night, guys. We'll see you. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please be sure to check us out on our website, uncorkedcorner.com, as well as on social media at Uncorked Corner. We are on every platform, but we are newly on YouTube sharing recipe content and all of our podcasts are shared there as well. So you can like and subscribe and share with your friends there. And don't forget, if you enjoyed listening to this podcast, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to us. Cheers. Cheers.